Now, now let's take a look at the following example. Now, in this example, in this example, we're going to combine the concept of mass spectrometry and infrared spectroscopy to basically determine what the structure of an unknown compound is. So suppose we have an unknown compound that consists of three atoms. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. After conducting elemental analysis of our unknown compound, we find that it consists of 80% carbon, 13.3% oxygen, and 6.6%. 7% hydrogen. Using this information as well as the mass spectrum and the infrared spectrum, we want to determine what the structure of our unknown compound is. So basically, we're going to break this problem down into three steps. In step one, we want to use this information, these percentages, to determine what the empirical formula is. Next, we want to use the empirical formula and the mass spectrum to basically determine what the molecular formula is. Now in step two, we want to use the equation for degree of unsaturation to determine the number of double bonds and or rings found in our compound. And finally, we want to use that information and the infrared spectrum to determine what the structure is. So let's begin with step one, determining the empirical and molecular formula. So whenever we want to determine the empirical formula, we assume that a total mass of the compound is some quantity, let's say 100 grams. So if the total mass is 100 grams, once again, this is assumed it's not the actual amount, so if it's 100 grams, we multiply it by this fractional quantity, so not 80%, but 0.8. And that gives us the total mass of the carbons out of this total 100 grams. So this gives us 80 grams of carbon. Now, what about the oxygen? We can basically follow the same procedure and, and we find that we have... 13.3 of oxygen. Finally, 100 grams multiplied by 0.67. This gives us 6.7 of, so these should be all grams of H. So out of the 100 grams, based on these percentages, 80 grams are carbon, 13.3 grams are oxygen, and 6.7 grams are hydrogen. Now the question is, what number of atoms does this mass actually correspond to? So to find that, we take 80 grams of carbon and divide by the atomic mass of carbon, so 12 grams, and we find about 6.67. So this represents the number of atoms of carbon. Now we can follow the same procedure for oxygen. 13.3 grams divided by 16 grams in one oxygen gives us 0 0.831. And finally, we have 6.7, divide that by 1, grams, grams, and we get 6.7. So this gives us the number of atoms of carbon, the number of atoms of oxygen, the number of atoms of our uh, hydrogen. Now, of course, we, we don't want to use fractions. We want to use whole numbers. And the way we convert these to whole numbers is by determining which one of these values values is the smaller value, namely this one, and then dividing each one of these values by the smallest one. So that basically means our empirical formula is as follows. So if we take this and divide it by 0.831, we get about 8, so we put an 8. If we take this and divide it by 0.831, we also get 8. And this divided by itself gives us 1. So this is the empirical formula of our unknown compound. Next, we want to determine what the molecular formula is by looking at the mass spectrum. Now, the mass spectrum basically gives us what the mass of our molecule is as well as the masses of the fragments into which our molecule actually breaks down.
down into. So, we know that the highest possible mass of our molecule is 120. Everything below basically corresponds to a fragment. Now, notice that if we calculate the molecular mass of this empirical formula, we also get 120. And that basically means that this corresponds not only to the empirical formula, but also to the molecular formula. So now we have the molecular formula. In step two, we want to determine the degree of unsaturation. So the number of pi bonds and or our rings is given by omega is equal to the following equation. So we have 2n plus 2 minus, or actually, yeah, minus number of H atoms, and we divide this whole thing by 2. So n corresponds to the number of carbons, and this corresponds to the number of H. So we have 8 carbons, 2 times 8 is 16, plus 2 is 18. 18 minus, we have 8, so 18 minus 8 is, is uh, 10. So we see that this omega is equal to 18 minus 8, which is 10. We divide this by 2, and this gives us 5. So we see that 5 is the number of double bonds and or rings in our structure. So this basically means because we only have 8 carbon atoms, this must correspond to a benzene. Because a benzene contains 1 ring and 3 pi bonds, so that means we have a total of 4 and we have 1 left over for a double bond probably between a carbon and an oxygen. So, let's begin by supposing that our structure looks something like this. So, we know that it's very likely that it is in fact a benzene that contains our three bonds. So that means we have one more quantity because one, two, three, and four, one more left over for another bond or ring. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. We have two more carbons left over. So that means one type of structure could be that it looks something like this. So we have we put the one more carbon, we have the oxygen, and we can place some type of methyl group. Now we can uh, place the methyl group e either here, we could place it here, or we can place it here. Let's suppose the methyl group is here. Now our other type of structure could also look something like this. So once again, we make the assumption that we do in fact have our benzene ring because this large number probably means we do have a benzene ring. And the other type could be something like this. So we can have an H here and we can have, or actually we can have a CH3 here and we can have an oxygen here. So once again, we see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. We have one, two, three, four, five, and we have three, so eight of these H's as well as the one oxygen. Now we can also have other types of structures, but let's stick to these two structures and let's see which one of these can this graph actually correspond to. So, let's begin with analyzing this infrared spectrum and looking at the following table. So I basically included all the functional groups that we're going to need to use. Now let's begin by looking at this section here. So this basically gives us, this gives us our wave number values for the CH bond inside the benzene ring as shown for mono substituted aromatic rings. So basically what that means, if we see that we have dips around these values, then that means we cannot have a di-substituted benzene ring. It must be a mono-substituted ring as shown in this diagram. 
So let's take a look at the following graph. So notice we're looking between 710 and 690. So if this is 600, then slightly below is about 690. And this corresponds to this, so we have it right here. Now what about the second one at 770 to 730? So this is about 700, this is about 800. So that means this corresponds to the second one. And in fact, these two peaks mean that we must have an aromatic ring that is monosubstituted. It cannot be this one because this contains not a monosubstituted but a disubstituted ring. So it cannot be this. Now, can it be this? Well, basically, we have to draw the other possibility. So let's finish up by drawing the third and final possibility of our uh, molecule. So we still have to have the mono, so we have to have our carbon here. Now the other possibility is basically we have our H right here and we go here, we have one more and we have the following. So it could also be something like this. So let's put, we have two H's here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight H's and one oxygen. So the difference between these two compounds is this is an aldehyde and this is not an aldehyde. Now let's take a look at the following functional group. So let's see our aldehyde. Aldehydes. So our aldehydes, if we do in fact have an aldehyde in our compound, it must have a dip around this quantity. So between 2900 and 2700 reciprocal centimeters. Now if we look at this graph, we don't have any peaks within this region and that means that we cannot have an aldehyde and so this, which is an aldehyde because we have the H here, cannot actually be it. So finally, let's confirm that our compound is in fact this molecule. And the way we're going to confirm that is to basically show that we have a ketone. So the, the um, carbonyl group as shown by this. So this is in fact a carbonyl and a carbonyl basically or a carbonyl has 1690. So if we look at the following x-axis and we go to 1690, so if this is 1500 or if this is 1500, this is 2000, this in fact does correspond to a value of about 1690. So that means based on the infrared uh, spectrum, we see that this is in fact the formula of our unknown compound. So we see that we were able to use the molecular formula by getting... <coughs> 